The year was 1965 and the Beatles had revolutionised pop music. They had number one singles and albums all over the world, and more importantly, they'd written the songs themselves. With this explosion of interest in the Beatles, teenagers all across America were going crazy for all of the new sounds that were coming out of Britain in the 1960s. The door had been opened and suddenly the time was right for a few little known bands from Britain like The Who, The Kinks and The Rolling Stones to get themselves heard. This is the story of Beatlemania and the British Invasion and how people started taking pop a little bit more seriously. In the 1950s, Elvis hadn't yet become the fat guy that died eating a burger on the toilet. He was the poster boy for a brand new genre of music called rock and roll. For a brand new genre of people called teenagers. I mean, before the 1950s, teenagers hadn't really been a thing. You went to school, and then you left and got a job, therefore becoming a real person. The idea that you could spend most of your teenagers just sat around playing Xbox would be pretty alien to them. During the Second World War, there was a big boom of babies being born, and that meant that after the war finished, there were quite a lot of young people just hanging around. Now while Britain in the 1950s was still pretty grey and living off rations, America started bursting into colour. If you've ever seen the film Grease or Back to the Future, then you start to get an idea of what life would be like for American teenagers. They started getting things like high school proms, drive through movies, and random spontaneous dance flash mobs in a fairground. On screen, rebellious icons like James Dean and Marlon Brando were capturing the hearts of girls and guys who wanted to fight back against their boring parents and their generation. And in the music world, Elvis was sending girls weak at the knees with his swinging hips and his snarl. James Dean is actually still a pretty huge icon today, and he's constantly being referenced in songs by people like Taylor Swift, Beyonce and Lady Gaga. So dreamy. <laughs> So the 1950s saw the pop music market really kicking off. The kids were using their newfound pocket money to buy the fresh singles that were hitting the charts. Most of the big songs at the time were being written and recorded in places in New York like Tim Pan Alley and the Brill Building, where they had teams of songwriters all working together to make these huge hits. Now these musicians would be cooped up in tiny little rooms, working 9 to 5, which is kind of more like an office worker than, you know, an inspired musician. The songwriters would actually be competing against each other to see who could write the biggest hits for the big pop stars of the day. And soon some pretty awesome songwriting partnerships were being formed. Back in the 1960s, obviously they had no internet, so finding new songs from America was actually pretty tricky. So what would happen is, a lot of the sailors would come back from America to England, and so quite often the port towns like Liverpool would be getting all these new imports coming from America. British teenagers couldn't get enough of these new sounds and started putting their own twist on things. The teenage John Lennon and Paul McCartney met when they were playing skiffle songs and that's kind of like homemade music with jugs and washboards. It sort of sounds like a Poundland version of Mumford and Sons. Oh my old man's a dustman, me wears a dustman's hat. And in the space of six years, they went from playing church fates and small parties to being the biggest band in the world. They quickly moved on from those skiffle sounds that they started out with to copying what they heard on the American records. They would listen to those records and work out how the chords went on the guitar. And now this is really important because they became an act that wrote and performed their own stuff. A few artists had written and sung their own stuff before, like Carole King, who was actually quite a big influence on the Beatles and who now has a West End musical about her. So the Beatles' live set had evolved from the skiffle music through to country and early rock and roll. And they also threw in a few surprise covers, like they used to play some musical theatre songs like Till There Was You, which is from the musical The Music Man. Their love of R&B and Motown was also pretty important as they were appealing to a black audience with covers of people like Smokey Robinson. This mashup of genres really influenced their own writing and was actually part of their appeal to so many different ages. So after years of playing sweaty venues around the UK and Germany, the Beatles went to London to record at one of the most famous studios of all time, Abbey Road. So they recorded their debut album in under 13 hours, which is an amazing achievement. And they got paid the grand total of £7.50 for the day. Seems like a fair amount, right? Don't worry, they did pretty well after that. <laughs> the world suddenly went crazy for the band, and two TV appearances really helped them out. The first one was Sunday Night at the Palladium, and in the UK that was a pretty big deal, because they had an audience of around 15 million. The Beatles played this in October 1963, and the Queen Mother was in the audience, and the host was Brucey himself. Nice to see you! I swear that guy never gets old. <laughs> they repeated this TV success in America the next year, where they went on the Ed Sullivan Show, and they blew those viewing figures out the water when they got 73 million people tuning in to watch them. Uh, there's a story that goes, in New York, when they were on TV, not a single crime was reported. So that means maybe the criminals were even tuning in. And just remember, all of this reaction was happening before social media was invented, so they had to get local DJs and local radio stations on board. This was the start of the craziness known as Beatlemania. These scenes look kind of familiar. Thank you very much and um, good evening. Fifty years later, One Direction caused similar scenes with crazy girls screaming and kind of confused dads. 
Actually, this isn't a brand new thing. The classical composer Franz Liszt got the same reaction from crazed fans back in the 1840s. Some of them tried to cut locks of his hair, and one woman actually made, like, a diamond locket out of a little piece of cigar that he'd thrown away onto the street. Anyway, these crazy scenes followed the Beatles wherever they went, and they soon became the first band to ever play stadiums. The only thing is, at their concerts the screaming was so loud, and the sound system in the venues was so bad, that no one could actually hear anything that they were playing. So soon the Beatles actually stopped gigging, and they started becoming more of a recording band. The huge popularity and success of the Beatles in America was pretty good news for all the other British bands that were trying to make it in America. But it just so happened that there was some pretty awesome music being recorded as well. The Who released My Generation, which was based on American rhythm and blues, and had lyrics which appealed to disillusioned teenagers. And the Kinks opened up the possibility for heavier rock, and later punk with their aggressive sounding hit single, You Really Got Me. That distinctive distorted guitar riff that they play in You Really Got Me was actually made by Dave Davis, the guitarist, when he got his amp and he got a razor and ripped it open. Little did he know that generations of musicians would be influenced by his sound for years to come. With the Beatles, it wasn't just Lennon and McCartney that were great songwriters. Soon George Harrison was writing amazing songs that would last the test of time. Even old Blue Eyes himself, Frank Sinatra, said that George Harrison's song, Something, was one of the greatest love songs of all time. Now that's pretty big praise. They were such prolific songwriters that they weren't just writing for the Beatles, they were writing for other acts as well, like Scylla Black and the Rolling Stones. At this point, the Rolling Stones were a pretty tight life band, and Mitch Jagger and Keith Richards were personal close friends of the Beatles. Lennon and McCartney actually gave the Rolling Stones one of their first singles called I Wanna Be Your Man. So apparently when they met, it was just an idea for a song that Lennon and McCartney had. So they only had the chorus, and they thought, okay, we need to finish this song pretty quickly. So they went into the corner of the club, and they sat down, and they actually wrote the rest of the song right in front of their eyes. And so for Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, this was a pretty big inspiration, and they thought, if they can do it that easily, why can't we? The influence of the Beatles and the British Invasion was spreading all over the world and these bands were starting to explore new exciting musical opportunities so they were looking into indie music and experimental classical techniques like sampling and they were putting them into a pop context that never would have happened 10 years earlier. Soon music started getting heavier and louder and the 1970s saw the birth of massive stadium rock bands like Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin. I haven't had time to go into all the British bands that broke America in the British Invasion but there's so many great bands that you should go and check out like The Animals, The Zombies and Herman's Hermits and so many more, so I'll put some links down below to check out some of the other bands that were going on. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Talk The Music, and if you want to listen to any of the music, again, I'll put links down below, and there's so much great stuff to listen to, so please go and have a listen. I'll see you next week for another episode of Talk The Music. And a lot of them would actually sleep through the symphony, so we thought, do you know what? I'm gonna scare these guys.